from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Screaming Skull of Greyfriars I never met a better fellow in the world than my old friend Alan Beauchamp. He had been educated at Eton and Magdalen at Oxford, after which he joined the crack regiment and later on took it into his head to turn doctor. He was a great traveler and a magnificent athlete. There was no game in which he did not excel. Curiously enough, he hated music. He had no ear for it, and he did not know the difference between the ears of Tommy, make room for your uncle, and the lost cord. He was tremendously proud of his pedigree. He had descended from the de Beauchamps and one of his ancestors. He gravely informed people had helped Noah to get the wasp and elephant into the ark. Another of them seems to have been not very far away in the Garden of Eden. In fact, they seem to have been quite prehistoric. He was quite cracked on the subject of brain transference, telepathy, spiritualism, ghosts, warnings, and the like, and on these points he was most uncanny and fearsome. The literature he had about them was blood-curdling. He believed in dual personality and in visions, horoscopes, and dreams. He showed me a pamphlet he had written entitled The Toad-Faced Demon of Lone Devil's Dyke. He was always flitting about Britain, exploring haunted houses and castles, and sleeping in haunted rooms when it was possible. Some years ago, Beauchamp and myself, accompanied by his faithful valet, rejoicing in the name of Pellingham Truffles, went to the Highlands for a bit of quiet and rest, and it was there I heard his curious story of the skull. We were sitting over a cozy fire after dinner. It was snowing hard outside and very cold. Our pipes were alight and our grog on the table when Alan Beauchamp suddenly remarked. It's a deuce curious thing for a man to be always followed about the place by a confounded grinning skull. What I said? Who the deuce is being followed about by a skull? It's rubbish and quite impossible. Not a bit, said my friend. I've had a skull after me, more or less, for several years. It sounds like a remark a lunatic would make, I rejoined rather crossly. Do not talk, Buncombe. You'll go dot if you believe such infernal rot. It is not Buncombe or a rot a bit, said Alan. It's gospel truth. Ask Truffles. Ask Jack Weston, or Jimmy Darkgood, or any of my South Country pals. I don't know Jack Weston or Jimmy Darkgood, I said. But tell me the whole story, and some day, if it is good, I'll put it in the St. Andrew Citizen. It's mostly about St. Andrew, said Beauchamp, so here goes. But Chavon some calls first. I did so, and then requested him to fire away. It was long, long ago, I think about the year 1513, that one of my ancestors, a man called Neville de Beauchamp, resided in Scotland. It seems he was an uncommonly wild dog, went in for racing and cards, and could take his wine and ale with any of Thorn, even those hard drinking days. He was known as Flash Neville. Later on, he married a pretty girl, the daughter of a silk mercer in Perth, who it seems died, they said, of a broken heart, two years after. Neville de Beauchamp was seized with awful remorse, became shortly after a monk in Greyfriars Monastery at St. Andrews. After Neville's wife's death, her relations seemed to have been on the hunt after him, burning for revenge, and the girl's brother, a rough wild dog in those stormy days, at last managed to track his cord down in the monastery at St. Andrews. Very interesting, I said. That monastery stood very nearly on the site 
of the present infant school, and we found the well in 1880. Well, what did this brother do? It seems that one afternoon after Vespers, he forced his way into the monastery, sought out Neville de Beauchamp, and slashed off his head with a sword in the Isle of the Quirk. Now a queer thing happened. His body fell on the floor, but the severed head, with a wild scream, flew up to the chapel ceiling and vanished through its roof. Mighty queer that, I said. The body was reverently buried, went on Alan, but the head never was recovered, and whirling through the air over the monastery, screaming and groaning most pitifully. It used to cause great terror to the monks and others at night. It was a well-known story, and few cared to venture in that locality after nightfall. The head soon became a skull, and since that time has always haunted some member of the house of Beauchamp. Now comes a strange thing. I went a few years ago and lived in rooms at St. Andrews for a change, and while there I heard of my uncle's death somewhere abroad. I had never seen him, but I had frequently heard that he was very much perplexed and worried by the tender attentions paid him by the skull of Neville de Beauchamp, which was always turning up at odd times and in unexpected places. This is a grand tale, I said. Now I come on the job, said Alan ruefully. That uncle was the very last of our family, and I wondered if that skull would come my way. I felt very ill and nervous after I got the news of my uncle's death. A strange sense of depression and oppression overcame me, and I got very restless. One stormy evening, I felt impelled by some strange influence to go out. I wandered about the place for several hours and got drenched. I felt as if I was walking in my sleep, or as if I had taken some drug or other. Then I had a sort of vision. I had just rounded the corner of North Bell Street, now called Greyfriars Garden, I remarked. Yes, well, when I got around that corner, I saw a large, strange building before me. I opened a wicket gate and entered what I found to be the chapel. Service was over, the lights were being extinguished, and the air was laden with incense. As I knelt in a corner of the chapel, I saw the whole scene, the tragedy of which I had heard, enacted all over again. I saw that monk in the aisle. I saw a man rush in and cut his head. I saw the body fall and the head fly up with a shriek to the roof. I came to myself. I found I was sitting on the low wall of the school. I was very cold and wet, and I got up to go home. As I rose, I saw lying on the pavement at my feet what appeared to be a small football. I gave it a vicious kick, when to my horror it turned over, and I saw it was a skull. It was gnashing its teeth and moaning. Then with a shriek it flew up in the air and vanished. A horrible thing. Then I knew the worst. The skull of the monk Neville de Beauchamp had attached itself to me for life. I being the last of the race, since then it is almost always with me. Where is it now? I said, shuddering. Not very far away, you bet, he said. It's a most unpleasant tale, I said. Good night, I'm off to bed after that. I was in my first sleep about an hour afterwards, when a knock came at my door, and their valet came in. Sorry to disturb you, sir, he said. But the skull has just come back. It's in the next room. Would you like to see it? Certainly not, I roared. Get away and let me go to sleep. Then and there I firmly resolved to leave next morning. I hated skulls, and I fancied that probably it might take a fancy to me, and I had no desire to be followed about the country by a skull, as if it was a fox terrier. Next morning I went to breakfast. Where is that beastly skull? I said to Alan. Oh, it's off again somewhere. Heaven knows where. But I have had another vision, a waking vision. What was it? Well, said Alan, I saw the skull and a white hand, which seemed to beckon to me beside it. Then they slowly receded, and in their place was what looked like a big sheet of paper. On it in large letters were the words, Your friend Jack Weston is dead. This morning I got this wire telling me sudden death. 
read it. That afternoon, I left the Highlands and Alan de Beauchamp. Since then, I have constant letters from him from his home in England. He has tried every means possible to get rid of that monk's skull, but they are of no avail. It always returns. So he has made the best he can of it and keeps it in a locked casket in an empty room at the end of a wing of the old house. He says it keeps fairly quiet, but on stormy nights, wails and gruesome shrieks are heard from the casket in that closed apartment. I heard from him last week, he said. Dear W.T.L., I don't think I mentioned that twice a year the skull of Neville de Beauchamp vanishes from its casket for a period of about two days. It is never away longer. I wonder if it still haunts its old monastery at St. Andrews, where its owner was slain. Do write and tell me if anyone now in that vicinity hears or sees the screaming skull of my ancestor, Neville de Beauchamp. The Spectre of the Castle Several years had elapsed since I met the butler of Lawsdry Castle in the Highland End. I had just come up from the south of England for some golf and fresh air. I was looking over my letters one morning at breakfast when I opened the following missive. Lawsdry Castle Sir, yours to command, sir, I have not forgot our pleasant talk on that snowy night up in the far north when you were pleased to be interested in my experience of Lawsdry. Could you very kindly meet me any day, any time you choose to fix at Lechars and oblige your obedient servant, Jeremiah Anklebone. P.S. I have something to divulge to you connected with St. Andrews that may absorb your mind. Accordingly, I fixed up arrangements and met Mr. Anklebone at Lechars, where we went to the nearest hostelry and ordered the best lunch they had there. Jeremiah looked thinner, older, and wider than when I last saw him, doubtless owing to his frequent communing with spirits. How is Lasdry getting on? I meekly inquired, and what of the ghosts? It is getting on fine, sir. I've had a number of new experiences since I, since I had the pleasure of seeing you last. You will understand, sir, that my family for generations have been favored with occult powers. My father was a great seer, and my grandfather, Mr. Concrety Anklebone, of the Isle of Skye was a wonderful visionary. Now Anklebone was an interesting old fellow, but he had a tiresome habit of wandering away from his theme, and as it were getting off the main road into a labyrinth of byways, and one had metaphorically to push him out of these side lanes and place him on his feet again in the main road. Before I come to St. Andrew's Castle, he said, I must tell you about a queer episode of an astral body at Lasdry a disentangled personality, as it were. Push along, I said, and tell me. Well, one afternoon after lunch, the master and I were in the dining hall when we saw a gentleman crossing the lawn towards the castle. He was a tall man in a riding dress with curly hair and a large flowing mustache. He came up to the window and looked in earnestly at us and then walked along the gravel walk round to the castle door. Hello, said the master. That is my old friend, Jack Herbert, to whom I have let Lasdry for this summer. What on earth can bring him here? I'll go to the door myself and let him in. He never said he was coming. In a minute or two, the master came back looking bewildered. Anklebone, he said, that's very queer. There is nobody there. Perhaps, I suggested, the gentleman has gone round to the stables. So we both hurried off to look but not a sign of anyone could be seen, and we stared blankly at each other. We could not make it out. Two days after, the master got a letter from Mr. Jack Herbert, telling him he had had a bad fall off his horse, had injured his spine, and was confined to bed. Mr. Herbert went on to say that two days before, while he was asleep, he dreamt vividly that he was at Lasdry, that he crossed the lawn to the window of the dining hall, and looking in saw my master and the butler, that's me, in the room. He was going round to the front door when he awoke. Now that was his astral body that master and I saw. He loved Lasdry, and during sleep he came and paid us that visit. Queer, isn't it? Ten days after he died. He wanted to see the old castle before he died, and his force of will 
brought his double self or astral body to visit us. It is not so uncommon as people think. Now, look here, Mr. Anglebone, I said. You know, I dare say, the stories about the cathedral, the haunted tower, and all that. Please, tell me what your experiences have been there. Anglebone's whole appearance suddenly changed. He gripped my arm violently, shivered and shuddered, and turned ghastly pale. I thought he was going to have a fit. For pity's sake, sir, he said, trembling, ask me nothing about that. There is something too terrible there, but I dare not reveal what I know and have seen to anyone. Do not allude to it again, or it will drive me mad. He lay back in his chair for a few moments, with his eyes closed and shaking all over, but he gradually recovered his usual appearance. I wish to tell you about the castle specter, he said weakly. I must confess that I felt nonplussed and disappointed at the turn the conversation had taken, as whatever my private opinion was regarding the worthy Jeremiah's curious statements, still I felt anxious to find out his experience at the cathedral particularly. However, I swallowed my disappointment like a Trojan and begged him to proceed. He gulped down his spirits and informed me he felt better again, but he did not seem quite himself for some time. Well, sir, he said, I often used to climb over the castle wall after dusk and smoke my pipe and meditate on all the grand folk that must have been there in bygone days before the smash-up. I thought of lovely young Queen Mary, of Mary Hamilton and her other Marys, of Lord Darnley, of the poet Castellar, of Lord Aaron and the Duke of Rothsay, and all the Stuart kings that used to be there. Then I thought of Prior Hepburn and poor murdered Cardinal Beaton, and of monks, knights, and lovely wenches that used to frequent the old place. I loved it, for I have read history a lot. One could not help thinking of the feasting revelry and pageants of those interesting old times, and the grand services in the church, and what fine dresses everybody wore. I saw he was going bang off the subject again, and when he began to tell me there were lots of ankle bones in Norman times about Fifeshire, I had to pull him back with a jerk to his ghost at the castle. Very well, sir. I was in the castle one evening. I was sitting on the parapet of the old wall when I saw a head appearing up the old broken steps on the east side of the castle that once led down to the great dining hall. I knew no one could now come up that way without a ladder from the sea beach, and when the figure got to the level ground, it came right through the iron railing just as if no obstruction were there. I stared hard and watched the advancing figure. It looked like a woman. I had heard of the Cardinal's ghost and wondered if it could be his eminence himself. Nearer and nearer it came, and although it was a gusty evening, I noticed the flowing garments of the approaching figure were quite still and unruffled by the wind. It was like a moving statue. As it passed me slowly a few yards away, I saw they were not the robes of a cardinal, but those of an archbishop. I am a churchman and know the garments quite well. I saw all his vestments clearly, and I shall never forget the pale ashen set face and the thin determined mouth. Then I noticed one very, very strange thing. The statuesque tall figure had a thick rope round the neck, and the end of the rope was trailing along the grass behind it, but there was no sound whatever. On it went and began to climb the stairs to the upper apartments. I tried to follow, but could not move for a bit. I felt as if I was mesmerized or paralyzed. I was all in a cold sweat too, and I was glad to get away from the castle at last and hurry home. I haven't gone so fast for many years. When I went next day to Lasdry, I made a clean breast of the whole affair to Master. Would you know him again, he asked me. I, I replied, I would know that face and figure among a thousand. Come to the study, said the Master, and I will show you some pictures. We went, and I looked over a number of them. At last. I came to one that fairly transfixed me. There was no mistaking the face. Before me was the picture of the specter I had seen that previous night in the ruined castle of St. Andrews. Well, Anklebone, said the master, this is really wonderful. And you actually saw 
the rope around its neck? I did, I said, as I am a living man. But who is it? It is not the cardinal? No, said the master very gravely. This man was publicly hanged by his enemies on a gibbet at the market cross of Stirling on April 1st, 1571. But who was he? I asked imploringly. The man or ghost you saw, said master, was Archbishop John Hamilton of St. Andrews in his own castle grounds where he once reigned supreme. I said farewell to Mr. Anklebone, and as I thought over his extraordinary story journeying home in the train, I could not help repeating over and over again to myself that very curious name that seemed to rhyme with the motion of the train, Concreti Anklebone.